Uh, thanks, Anatoly. Um, by way of introduction, my name is Dr. Jenna Jacobson, and I'm an assistant professor at Toronto Metropolitan University, which many of you know uh, formerly as Ryerson University. Um, today's presentation, I'm going to be focusing on a specific type of data collection, which is self-reported data, and even more specifically, surveyed data. Um, I'm part of the research team that is organizing today's workshop, so I'd like to thank you in advance for joining us physically as well as all of you virtually as well. Um, just a brief outline of uh, my presentation today, I'm going to introduce antisocial behavior following up on what Dr. Gruz um, uh, has already mentioned, uh, introduce self-report data, uh, introduce some of the constructs and scales that you can be working with when you're using survey data, and then end with some of the advantages and disadvantages. So while antisocial behavior is not a new phenomenon on the internet, this is certainly not something that uh, has just emerged, the number of people who experience or who are witnessing um, antisocial behavior online has risen exponentially. Uh, some recent research suggests that 60% of Canadian adults have encountered hate speech, racist, or sexist content at least once a month. Even more troubling than this is when we look at our young people, one in every five young Canadians have experienced cyberbullying or cyberstalking. Um, as a consequence, um, the rise of um, antisocial behavior has increased the public's awareness and perceptions of um, the importance of studying this important um, topic. Of course, there's many different ways of going about studying antisocial behavior. Um, and we believe that beginning with a strong theory or model is a, a strong approach to understanding and grounding your research. Um, as part of our research, um, we are applying an ecological model, which suggests three levels of impact and really shows how the multiple uh, levels of impact have these multiple overlapping relationships. So it's not just it's not just an impact of the individual or perhaps the community, but rather how this is having a more global um, impact. If we look at the personal level, um, antisocial behavior on social media has real life consequences that are both psychological and emotional. Um, shifting to the community level, we can understand how uh, the rise of antisocial behavior and the experiences of antisocial behavior have impacts within our communities, where we're living, in our families, this kind of um, meso level. The third level is, of course, societal. And this is our larger macro systems and the various impacts that this is having in our workplaces, in our, um, not beyond our workplaces, so in our communities that we are living in, in our societies, in our countries, and then more, more broadly, of course, in, in the world. What impact is this having in the world? So to understand this widespread impact and the experiences of antisocial behavior, our research team is currently asking two research questions for our specific survey. And I'm going to be introducing some of the constructs and some of the scales that we're using in the research to try and highlight how survey research can be done in the context of antisocial, um, of studying antisocial behavior online. So our first research question is what is the prevalence of various types of antisocial acts on social media? So this is really to get a lay of the land of, a, of an understanding of how are Canadians experiencing antisocial behavior. And this is important because not only do the platforms change, but the types of harassment that exist also evolve over time. We can see things like deep fakes, um, revenge porn. These are things that have emerged more recently in the online space that certainly have historical um, 
um, that certainly have a longer history, but um, these are more recent occurrences. So what is the prevalence of these various types of antisocial behavior? The second question is who is more likely to be a perpetrator or a victim of uh, antisocial acts? And this is really getting at some of the um, socio-demographic characteristics and social media use habits. So this is, of course, part of our ongoing research. And the goal of this presentation is really just to understand, to give a primer, an introduction to how you could be using self-report data um, in your own research. So self-report data, to provide a little bit of an introduction, um, is it a common approach which asks participants about their feelings, their attitudes, their behaviors, and so forth, um, where respondents are reading a question um, and responding, uh, responding to that without outside interference. So typically, when we think about this, we are referring to um, surveys, uh, questionnaires, polls, um, and these can include open-ended or close-ended questions. The research instruments can also include new questions. These are things that are developed specifically for the research topic that other researchers have not previously used. Um, or you can be using existing validated scales for particular constructs. And I'm going to be going over both types of these that we are using in our research. So for our larger surveys, um, we aim to have a nationally representative sample of the Canadian population. To do this, we use Statistics Canada's Census of Population, which provides a statistical uh, demographic breakdown of the country. An interesting note, uh, which we are very excited by, is that the 2021 iteration um, of the StatCan survey included a question on, on gender, which allowed for cisgender, transgender, and non-binary people to um, report their gender. This was previously a problem in the research because at the pre-screening stage, it wasn't inclusive. It was asking people, are you male or, or female? Um, we previously tried to kind of rectify this by later in the survey asking a um, more inclusive question about gender identity. But these new changes, which only took place in 2021, uh, StatCan suggests makes Canada the very first country to actually collect and publish data on gender diversity from this national census perspective, which I think is something that we can be quite proud of. Um, uh, so we asked a few simple, demo simple demographic questions um, at the beginning of the survey as part of this pre-screening um, to ensure a nationally representative sample. This is based on age, gender, and location to um, match the distribution of the Canadian population. Our first set of questions uh, were new questions um, that aren't specifically testing a construct. Um, this is really to get at general information about social media, uh, about the participants' social media use, um, about the frequency of use on different platforms, their privacy settings, uh, whether people are anonymous on the platforms, whether they're linking their personal accounts, and so forth. Um, this follows a previous survey that we have, um, that we completed on Canadians' social media use, um, and then also adding in some new questions that are specifically getting at antisocial behavior as they are emerging. And this is important because, as I mentioned, there are so many new iterations of antisocial behavior that we need to be constantly um, scanning uh, the media, scanning um, uh, other research in order to understand what is there that is new that needs to be constantly updated. Based on your theoretical framework and the analytical approach, you need, to, you need to also select some instruments and scales for constructs 
um, we selected some of our instruments and scales that have been tested and validated by prior research. There are countless scales and constructs uh, that can be used for antisocial um, uh, behavior research. We conducted a very extensive literature review um, looking at all of the different scales, approaches, um, and constructs. Um, but really, this ultimately comes down to um, the research objectives. So it's not necessarily going to be the same for one group setting antisocial behavior. Um, because it depends on the context, the type of antisocial behavior, and so forth. For the purposes of illustration, I'll highlight some of the constructs that we are working with. Um, so in our survey on antisocial behavior, which we have piloted, um, and in the fall we're going to be releasing out into this nationally representative sample, we included a series of questions on specific constructs um, that you'll see listed here. So things like self-disclosure, online dis disinhibition, and so forth. Um, in order to analyze the data, we are using um, partial least squares uh, structural equation modeling, which is a bit of a mouthful, mouthful but PLS SEM, to analyze the data. And this is a statistical software that allows for a non-parametric approach that can handle complex models. So it doesn't need, the data doesn't need to be normally distributed. It allows for a smaller sample size. Um, and PLS SEM can be used to test relationships between multiple independent and dependent variables simultaneously, which is important for our specific case study. So looking at the specific constructs, self-disclosure, um, as you uh, may be aware, is the communication practice of disclosing personal information. The self-disclosure scale, which is adopted to the social media context, can be used to measure three different dimensions of self-disclosure. Amount and depth, which is the length and the level of intimacy of the disclosure. Conscious control, which is the intentionality of the disclosure, as well as honesty. So how truthful uh, is this disclosure? Another construct we're measuring is online inhibition, which refers to the phenomenon of people saying or perhaps even doing things online that they normally wouldn't do in offline uh, situations and in other spaces. So the online disinhibition scale can be used to measure two different dimensions of online disinhibition. So we have the benign aspects, and these are just things that of online um, disinhibition in which people are motivated to engage in positive interactions online. So this doesn't actually mean that just because we're anonymous, we're always going to be doing negative things, but we could actually encourage us to do um, positive interactions. On the other hand, and the side that's interesting for antisocial behavior, is the toxic dimensions of online disinhibition. And this is when people are motivated to use the affordances of online platforms to propagate hate and other forms of antisocial behavior. Next, we have self-esteem, and this refers to the self-perception um, or the perception that an individual has of themselves. So in order to evaluate levels of empathy, the respondents, um, we use the Rosenberg self-esteem scale, um, which is a widely cited uh, scale, and can be used uh, uh, to measure two different dimensions of self-esteem. Self-confidence, which refers to uh, the positive attributes towards the self, as well as self-depreciation, which is the negative perceptions of the self. Next, we have empathy. Empathy refers to the ability to interact and understand the emotions of others. We often uh, hear this about uh, having emotional intelligence, and it's really about how you can imagine yourself uh, in the shoes of another person and feeling and, uh, and interacting uh, with those emotions. 
The basic empathy scale can be used to analyze two different dimensions. We have a cognitive dimension of empathy, and this is associated with um, the capacity to comprehend the emotions of others. How much can you understand another person's emotions? We also have the affective dimension of empathy, and this is related to how one experiences the emotions of others. Second last, we have the cyber aggression and cyber victimization scale, which can be used to identify cyber victims and cyber um, aggression perpetrators. One of the interesting things with doing this type of research is that somebody may in fact be a perpetrator as well as a victim of antisocial behavior. So it's not enough to merely ask someone, are you a victim? and are you a perpetrator, and put them into two separate boxes, but rather to understand the nuances and focus on the acts themselves. So to identify cyber aggression perpetrators, there's a series of 12 questions which include statements of how a person acts towards another person, uh, such as uh, questions about posting something embarrassing or mean about another person. Um, to identify the cyber victims, there's again another 12 indicators that are focused on being on the receiving end of these behaviors, uh, like such as receiving, um, having a photo or a video posted of you um, that you didn't want other people to see. And of course, the scale of that could be, you know, uh, uh, a an inappropriate photo of you drinking with friends when you were young onto something like revenge porn, which is, of course, perhaps seen as more serious. This scale particularly is important uh, because it focuses on the cyber aggressive behavior. So the specific acts um, that are associated with cyber aggression. Um, and a lot of other scales in the space focus on single channels of digital communication. So, figure, so focus on the communication um, methods themselves, which is a limitation of previous research. The last scale that I'll mention for the purposes of today um, is related to the previous um, to the previous construct, but this is to get at the motivations. So if you are a person who does engage in the perpetration of online um, antisocial behavior, um, we can use the cyber aggression typology questionnaire in order to understand what are your motivations? Why are you, why are you actually doing this? And this is an adapted construct that looks at four motivations, rage, revenge, reward, and recreation. A nice little iteration there with all the R's. Um, and by specifically understanding why are people doing this? What motivates people to engage in these various types of antisocial behavior? Um, we, can, we, can help, we can use and develop interventions to reduce antisocial behavior. So as Anatoly mentioned later on in the project, uh, it's not just enough to understand what is happening in Canadian society, but rather what can actually be done. Identifying the problem is step one. We know antisocial behavior is a problem. We don't quite know the, the prevalence or the um, severity of this, the impact. But the next stage of the research really needs to address what can be done? What are the interventions at the individual at the individual level, organizational level? What can platforms be doing? What can we as a society be doing to address antisocial behavior? Of course, these various constructs fit within the context of our research, but they need to be uh, adapted or changed as we learn from our own pilot studies um, and as the research continues. Like all methods, taking a little step back, like all methods, using self-report data um, in surveys has its advantages and challenges. So if you're looking to understand antisocial behavior online, surveys are one approach, but there are obviously advantages and disadvantages here. 
advantages, quick, you're getting, uh, you're able to reach a large group of people. You can also collect the data quite quickly, uh, certainly a lot faster than doing interviews with 1,500 people. Um, uh, relatedly, it can be quite a cost-effective method of collecting a large amount of data quickly. It can be representative, as our research is seeking to do, so you're speaking to a, the, of a larger population, like the Canadian population. The data can be collected remotely, which is certainly an advantage, specifically um, with the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, as well as you can use advanced statistical methods like the uh, PLS-SEM that I was describing. There are also various advantages to collecting data based on the sampling strategies themselves, as, as well as different disadvantages. So how are you actually going to access these people, this large group of people? Um, we've used various different sources in our past research. Um, one, one space is Amazon Mechanical Turk or other crowdsourcing services like this. Um, and these are market, these are um, uh, uh, services that are organized much like a marketplace where the requester or a researcher can post an online task, such as a survey, and people around the world uh, on this site is called workers or called Turkers can complete this for um, compensation. Um, prior research indicates that Turkers perform uh, tasks primarily to supplement their in income or also for their personal enjoyment. And the pool of, of participants is actually quite stable over time and includes a sample that is um, quite comparable to standard internet samples, um, as well as other more traditional approaches. Um, and it's generally a low cost way of accessing uh, data. The second approach is student research pools. This provides access to a large group of largely undergraduate students. Um, some universities, like my own university, has a well-established um, program that provides students at, uh, the opportunity to take place in research studies. Um, and it's either low cost or no cost, and students can get credit towards their courses. More expensive, um, of course, is a national survey company. And this is what we're going to be doing in the fall. And this can be highly targeted or the representative sample. Um, this, uh, this has the advantage of, um, of perhaps being nationally representative, but it comes with a larger cost associated with this type of data collection. Across all of these different approaches, one of the chief concerns or uh, challenges with survey self-report data is data reliability. And this is particularly important when we're studying antisocial behavior because respondents may not feel encouraged or comfortable to provide those honest, accurate, raw um, emotions and reflections about their own perpetration. So it's one thing to reflect on your own experiences as a victim, how, how um, what you have received online, um, but you may not be as forthcoming about your own experiences being a perpetrator of antisocial um, behavior. At the same time, you also may not feel as comfortable sharing the impact. What has been the impact of the, that antisocial behavior that you have either received or perpetrated? Has it had personal consequences? Has there been workplace consequences? Has it, um, has it, it affected your family, your mental health, and so forth? Um, with that said, um, we, we'd like to always think that participants are filling out surveys ethically and carefully, but the reality is that there's going to be a subset of your population that, that is simply not true. Um, some ways to address this is an attention check question, and this is use useful to ensure that participants are actually paying attention and reading the questions. So it could be something like, um, uh, 
whatever the answer to this question is, select the first or the fourth response. And this ensures that people are actually reading the full question and, and um, responding appropriately. We, in, we include a series of these throughout the, throughout the survey, um, just so that people aren't clicking haphazardly and is, and is proved to be uh, really important, specifically with our student samples, where we could have uh, as many as about 25% of students failing to accurately uh, answer the attention checks. A second uh, useful strategy is to do a post-data um, uh, analysis to make sure that people aren't answering the questions too quickly. If you anticipate that your survey is going to be running for 15 minutes, it should take people 15 minutes to answer your survey, and they complete the survey in five minutes, well, chances are they may not be reading and answering that, um, that survey very carefully. So you want to remove those, those participants from your survey. Overall, you need to just feel confident in your data. Having Going through the process of cleaning your data, you want it to accurately reflect the population. You want it to accurately um, have internal as well as external um, validity. And these are various strategies that you can do from the time of your theoretical conception to actually developing your survey, figuring out how you're going to access your sample, down to the cleaning of your data, as well as the analysis and reproduction. So overall, I hope this provided a brief primer on self-report data. Um, and part of today's workshop, the goal is to introduce you to different types of data collection that you can do um, when we're specifically looking at approaches to studying antisocial behavior. Thank you. Great, we have time for a couple questions, and so far, nothing in the chat. <laughs> Thanks, Jenna. And the constructs that you identified, um, are you able to indicate what some of the more, I guess, interesting to you overlaps are between them or perhaps differences? Yeah, so um, thanks, George, for your question. So the, the model that we're specifically um, developing is to try and look at, um, at those relationships. Are there, in fact, relationships um, that we can identify um, uh, in, in, based on the participants' responses. So, for example, some of our preliminary data, again, haven't fully analyzed, but the preliminary data with our, stu with our student pool, if we're looking at the motivations for, um, uh, the motivations for antisocial behavior and the perpetration of that, we found that there was a relationship between the recreation and reward, so having those kinds of um, uh, going about doing these antisocial acts because it's kind of fun, you want to you want to just you know do this in a lighthearted way, um, and the perpetration of these acts, but we didn't find any relationship between the revenge and uh, rage and revenge. So people were not actually in the sample weren't actually. Um, going online and engaging in these antisocial acts because somebody else did something to them and they felt angry about it and they were responding to this. So that's actually, that's looking at the relationship within a single construct, right? Rather, what are the motivations? Then if you take a step further and what are what's the relationship between those various constructs, um, that's what the, the larger model is seeking to do. So are there in fact relationships between some of, uh, between some of these um, constructs? Previous research would seem to suggest yes. Uh, some of our preliminary data um, has indicated that a lot of them actually are not, um, are not panning out in a statistically significant way. So things that we may have previously thought um, uh, are not showing up. So I don't want to conclusively say any of those findings because 
it's just a pilot at the moment, and we are certainly going to be releasing the national sample. So, for example, the, the example I gave with the uh, recreation and reward, that may be something that's specific to young people who are engaging in this type of behavior that may not actually pan out in a larger sample of adults. You know, how a 60-year-old uh, um, man sitting in, in um, Quebec experiences antisocial behavior. So those, those relationships are exactly what um, the statistical model is hoping to tease out. Okay. Thank you. We have a question from Dina Abul Fatou. Um, in the pre-screening questions, she says, do you look at variables such as race or religion since these could be specifically um, targeting vulnerable groups online? That's an interesting question. So we actually, um, in the pre-screening um, in our previous, again, this hasn't launched yet, so something we could think about, but in the pre-screening, of our um, our previous survey, we haven't matched it up to race or religion. We do ask those questions later on in the survey in order to get at the um, uh, in order to get at demographics. So we would be able to assess, um, but we don't do that in terms of getting a nationally representative sample. But that's an interesting perspective as, as to whether we should consider perhaps including race or religion, um, because that may, that may indeed have an impact on experiences of antisocial behavior, because as we know, you know, minority groups are more likely to um, experience antisocial behavior, as well as receiving uh, different forms of antisocial behavior. So thank you for your question, Dina. I think there's a question in the, over here. Um, yeah, so I was wondering um, if you, there's any scale that says how sensitive people are to other people's criticism. So mm -hmm. how, how sensitive will I be as a victim if somebody uh, says something? Uh, I just wondered about the, how to get a sense of their emotional readiness, in a sense, for the attack uh, to have a bad effect. That's an interesting, it's an interesting question because I can think of kind of two separate constructs. Um, one being like empathy, right? That's an understanding of emotions and almost like a self-awareness. So it's kind of a combination of empathy and self-awareness. Um, I can't think on the top of my head and certainly not uh, anything that we encountered in the literature on, um, on a construct that specifically measures that. Maybe it could be... Uh, Maybe it could be something that's a, 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 re, a reflected construct in, in something else. Um, but if anybody has any suggestions or online, anybody's aware of uh, such a scale, that would be an interesting one to, to tease out. OK, I think we are wrapping up. So thank you very much for your time, attention, and, a, and questions. And I think we're heading into a short break. <laughs>